Thank you very much. And apolo apologies to uh, apologies to the tech guys for any grief they had uh, switching the presentations around. Uh, I'm going to call up our first uh, real presenter today, Lou Tucker. Uh, Lou is a great speaker, a knowledgeable person, scholar, and gentleman. Um, he is the uh, CTO of cloud computing at Cisco Systems and always has fascinating things to say about the emergence of computing in general and the role of util utility computing in our lives. Lou? Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Hope I get my pictures up. Actually, okay. <laughs> um, what I wanted to talk to you about actually today is putting your own data center in the cloud. As we've moved through cloud computing in the last couple of years, we've seen sort of the explosion in the use of infrastructure as a service. And what I wanted to come back to is actually some of the questions about what we certainly want to leave behind in the data center, but what we also want to bring to get bring forward in kind of building your own virtual data center in the cloud. So at Cisco, in fact, most of you probably know Cisco as a provider of, of a lot of networking equipment, and we are an infrastructure provider that also, what you may not know, is today we're number two in terms of blade servers. So we took a different approach with this, and we actually are making a unified computing system whereby we're integrating both the networking and the computers, making the entire system managed from an API. That makes it ideal for cloud computing build-ups. We also, as you probably know, work with a large number of our partners to provide a full stack. Uh, this is in includes uh, EMC, VMware, NetApp, and a, a variety of others so that we can provide solutions to our customers. Of course, being able to do this securely requ really requires the technology behind networking so that you can securely access your cloud applications, everything else. And we also are providing a cloud service around collaboration in terms of WebEx and others. So our view is, in fact, that cloud computing, though, is not just one thing. It's actually, we're going to see a world of many clouds, be them public, pri public clouds, private clouds, hybrids, mixes of the both. And then also, I think moving forward, we'll start to see the emergence of different kinds of clouds that are oriented around the different vertical industries. Obviously, financial services companies have different regulatory requirements and, and healthcare requirements in terms of their, their regulatory requirements. All of these things mean that we will see a world of many clouds, but it's important that we get the cloud computing model right. And that's what I wanted to just briefly talk about here today. So when you look at real data centers, you walked into modern data centers today, they're really phenomenal uh, places to be. They're really managing heat, they're managing power, and that you're seeing lots and lots of servers and storage and cables often everywhere networks. So there's a lot of things that are going on, including in the management of this physical infrastructure. And many of the things that we're talking about this week is about having letting somebody else manage all of that so you can actually enjoy the benefits of cloud computing without having to be involved in this. If you look specifically in terms of the networking technologies that make up a, a sophisticated data center, there's a lot of different technologies that are used to be able to combine all of these services together and the, to deliver them across multiple data centers, across the internet, so you can actually have the experience that you need. And this is also changing very quickly. We're moving from giggy, 10 giggy, 20 giggy, continuous advancements in terms of the technologies that make up the data center. But do you really want to deal with all of this? Probably not. So what really is required as you start thinking about putting your data center in the cloud? What is a virtual data center? And that's why I wanted to come back to some of the things around networking. So what we'd like to be able to do is give access to people to actually program the networks, but with actually from in, in terms of expressing their own requirements, without having to know the low-level details. You certainly don't need to know the particularly networking protocols and things that actually make networking work. So the model, like in computer science, we do all the time is to create another layer of indirection, another platform, a series of APIs that abstracts those resources so that the user now who is running their application can define what they need, express that to this layer, and have the underlying infrastructure then make that so. So applications almost always start on a whiteboard. If you've been involved in any of sort of the design or, or building up of these systems, you have engineers that are running up to whiteboards and they're scribbling things on there and they're saying, here are the web servers, the app servers, 
perhaps even going into, you know, with, with caching, memcached and other kinds of things, and you end up with a sort of an architecture that has topology associated with it. You're uh, describing at this actually how the flow works in the system, what services talk to other services. And what we'd like to be able to do is take this kind of a diagram and express that then in a virtual data center. Abstractions are used all the time. In fact, we couldn't have computers today without these software abstractions that allow us to go basically from electrical signals into bits and storage and into operating systems and applications. I'm old enough, I actually was programming in punched cards and programming in assembly language. And now we've really moved up where we have high-level languages and frameworks that make it easier to build applications. And in fact, networking itself is fundamentally built on a series of layers uh, in the OSI model and TCP models that allow you to actually go from a very, you know, physical layer in terms of the signals or the protocols that are doing that all the way up to where a Unix programmer can just deal with sockets and sending messages around. So these abstra abstractions are really key to this and you have to get those abstractions right. So let's look at cloud computing for a moment. In this environment we have these fundamental abstractions today around a compute service if you think of EC2 where you're really talking about the abstractions that of a virtual machine. So you can specify that as a resource that you want and you can specify also how much memory you want on that, how much disk, and so forth. And then the operations you can do on that, you can suspend that, you might be able to clone it or migrate it to another, another virtual machine. Storage has a similar kind of model where you have virtual disks. In fact, in a processor, we actually divide up the processor, putting many virtual machines on top of it. And in storage, we sort of went the other way. We took a lot of disk and make it look like one big disk, one big storage system. But what about networking? What do you really want to see in your data center in the cloud? And what do you want to be able to express about the topology or the networking constructs there today? Fortunately, we do have examples of this, less than known examples than perhaps EC2, but for example, it's Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, where they're actually making it possible for you to now connect to a, essentially your own private cloud running on Amazon, where you have networking constructs in that. VMware's vCloud Director is another example, and there's, there are other ones that are out there as well. So networking and a network service, I think, is an essential part of cloud computing so that we can have a compute service, storage service, networking service. And now with that trinity, you can complete building out your virtual data center. So one place that we looked to try to do some of this work at Cisco was really looking at a, at a new thing that we'll hear a lot about, I think, in the rest of this week with other uh, talks around OpenStack, which is an open source software community making it possible for anybody to build their own private or public clouds. This is both for service providers and for enterprises. It started just shortly a time ago in terms of July 2010 with the initial contributions coming from NASA and Rackspace. Today there's over 150 companies involved. It's a very, very active community. In fact, if you look at any in the San Francisco area, the meetups that are going on, almost every week there are, there are collections of developers getting together to help build this out. Our own involvement at Cisco is that I have a team associated with this where we are really looking to, to contribute to this community effort. And that it allows us to work with both our partners and our customers. And most importantly, it also allows us to innovate. In open source community, you get to actually propose new blueprints, new ideas that you have, and be able to work with the rest of the community to bring those ideas about. And in fact, you can see some of this work from Cisco today. Uh, in the Expo Center where we actually are running OpenStack and on top of that we're putting one of our, our catalog services. So in terms of our intelligent automation cloud, we were able to run that then on top of this new platform which is OpenStack. So Quantum is the name of this network service that Cisco and about 14 other companies have, are collaborating on today. And essentially what it allows the user to do is to create multiple private networks or subnets in their own virtual data center. So in that little diagram, if you remember from the whiteboard, you can start to express that diagram as saying, here we want to have two web servers. We want to have it talking to a virtual network segment to an app server. And then that way you actually can make it so that they are the database server behind it. That actually means that you can keep that isolated and not make it routable from the internet. One of the things I don't like to do, actually having run large scale infrastructure, is have databases that are routable from the internet which is generally a bad idea. It also allows you to then connect up to other kind of networking services. If you already have an investment in some very large scale load balancers, firewalls, and things like that, 
having this network service allows you to start to incorporate those into your design. So it's a very simple construct in terms of these virtual network segments and in terms of then attaching virtual machines or services to those segments. So one of the important things, however, a network service provides is really this linkage. If you think of the user application, that's where you are creating your application, your virtual data center, and, but it's sitting, in fact, running on a physical data center. And the network service provides that interface between those two layers, that translation layer between what the user is trying to express in terms of their application, their topology, and what is realizable in terms of the physical infrastructure. This hides all that complexity of the physical infrastructure but gives you the capabilities that you need to have your application work. There's two ways of looking at this. One is in terms of the user itself in a multi-tenant environment, and that there also, though, associated other services, such as the compute service. If you're going to launch a VM and attach it to a network, you need to have those services talk to each other. And there are system APIs, therefore, that allow other services, privileged services, to talk to this. Most importantly, though, is in terms of the architecture of the network service itself, and forgive me for getting somewhat technical, but every, every kind of service has its own sort of architecture that allows us to make this, this transition between the two worlds. And that's done through what's known as the plug-in architecture. So this shows actually the details inside of how quantum this network service is constructed. And remember, it needs to bridge both this virtual world and the physical world. So at the top of this is actually where you have your APIs that allow software developers and system administrators to be able to talk to the service. And this, this network service abstracts everything. And it does not do the top level, does, is not concerned at all with the actual implementation. As you're going down in this now, there's a plug-in API. And the plug-in API allows any vendor or any, any operator to plug in essentially hardware specific, think of this as the hardware abstraction layer, where you actually now can talk to physical hardware. Or you may be talking to virtualized switches that exist in the hypervisor itself. This is the transition between the multi-tenant user environment and actually the system controlled environment in, on either the compute hosts or on the networking system itself. Now the way to allow also innovation in this is to allow then the exposure of API extensions. This allows innovation to happen. Different vendors or different open source uh, plugins here will allow different properties to be expressed around those resources. And that's a key element here in terms of how that we can have a common API but also allow innovation to, to flourish. The result then is what we really believe is that this richer set of capabilities that we feel people will be required to have in virtual data centers. So here we have just two tenants being pictured here. Tenant A has has a number of virtual machines. Tenant V's got something very simple. Tenant A has multiple networks, isolated private networks, and they can bring actually their own IP addresses in here. So one of the things you'd like to be able to do is be able to have control over your host names and IP addresses because that might have the same IP addresses as tenant B. You may be on a 10.0.1 network and somebody else may be on that 10 because it's in an isolated environment, yet it's still running in a multi-tenant environment. This is what's made possible when you create these virtual isolated networks. And then, of course, what you want to be able to do is connect up to other services. So you maybe have VPNs, you ha may have gateways to out into the internet, or gateways into other services that you want, and be able to have access to things such as firewalls, load balancers, and I hope in the future, very interesting new network-centric services that will be developed and provided by, by others in that environment. So the essential question then really is, so what makes sense? We want to keep this very, very simple, very, very core, get the abstractions right, also make it extensible, so that perhaps what we'd really like to be able to do in the future is be able to say, I would like to create a virtual ne network segment. Currently, what is available today in quantum today is L2 semantics. We might also want to have L3 semantics. Or you may want to be able to have bandwidth guarantees, or something that would monitor SLAs. So you'd be able to tell whether you really are getting the performance that you expect to out of your cloud uh, service provider. Quality of service becomes really important here. You may want to be able to say, I want to be able to attach this network. This network is, in fact, optimized for being able to, to handle multimedia streaming. So a lot of the underlying network technologies we saw in, in the first couple of slides now are able to be expressed in an abstract way and made available up into the developers. 
You perhaps may also want to span multiple data centers. When we talk about hybrid cloud, many people are talking about being able to burst their, their capabilities from an enterprise into a service provider, and they want that extension to look like it's on their same network. So this allows you to do those kinds of things. Lastly, I just wanted to comment that networking itself, as with the rest of the architecture and the language, is changing very radically. I mean, that we're seeing an evolution of something called software-defined networks. We've got new protocols, perhaps like OpenFlow and others. And this means that there may be new capabilities that we want to be able to expose as those technologies mature up into the application layer. And this kind of an architecture is, is actually what makes it possible. So with that, in this short period, I just wanted to sort of briefly overview that. You'll probably be hearing a lot more about OpenSAC and other talks today that we are going to be available also in the expo. And that I think this notion, and I want you to think very deeply about what you want in your own virtual data center in the cloud. I think this is an area that will continue to evolve, and we need many, many use cases. So you should really think about as you're either putting your first data center into the cloud, and what do you want it to look like? What are your applications look like, and what are their requirements? This is an open community-driven process. It's actually moving a, a governance into a foundation. So that I really urge you to get involved so that we can all work together to get the kind of data centers in the cloud that we feel are appropriate. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Lou. And may I say, great pictures on your slides. <laughs> yeah, good. All right, uh, our next speaker, Bill Gillis, uh, is going to talk to us a little about one of the most contentious issues in the cloud, which is data privacy and his journey to trying to fix that. Um, cloud computing has tremendous potential for all sorts of industries, 